Hi, this is Stephen Greenhut. I'm the director of the Pacific Research Institute's Free City Center, where we look at uh, great ideas to make cities better places. And I'm here with uh, Judge Glock, who at this at the State Policy Network conference in Phoenix, SPN's the big annual gathering of think tank gurus and academics, and we try to put together interesting ideas. So. Uh, Judge, why don't you introduce yourself, and uh, you're with the with the Manhattan Institute, and tell us a little bit about your book and your background. And... Uh, yeah, that's correct. So my name is Judge Glock. I'm director of research over the Manhattan Institute. Uh, I was formerly a, a professor of economics at West Virginia University, focused on uh, housing and mortgage policy. I uh, wrote a, a, a scintillating or scintillating, never quite know, book on the, the history of the mortgage market. And, uh, yeah, I do a lot of work today on issues around housing, finance, and uh, homelessness in cities writ large. Okay, great. Well, thanks for uh, joining us. And uh, you had a really fascinating panel about uh, housing today. And uh, it's, it's one of the interesting things, is, but this is a free market gathering, is some of the free market politicians I've dealt with in California, like uh, in Huntington Beach, is controlled by Republicans and they they are not in favor of free markets when it comes to housing. They they do the NIMBY thing, the not in my backyard thing. They're trying to uh, challenge different state laws that make it easier to build. So I'm wondering why do you think uh, some of the conservatives have have lost their understanding of free markets, or maybe they never even had that understanding to lose. Well, everyone's for free markets when it benefits them, and not necessarily for them when it doesn't. And uh, but one of the things I, I've tried to do in the, the housing discussion is, although coming from a fundamentally free market stance, try to understand and appreciate the perspective of those people who do care about neighborhood character and uh, protecting the certain uh, environment they happen to live in or want to even develop if they're a developer. Uh, a lot of people on the, the left and the right consider municipal zoning or some other building regulations as something like a community property right. Uh, that they should be able to exercise some amount of control over, which but it shouldn't necessarily uh, be overturned uh, by the state or, or by other actors. Now, uh, I think this is uh, often uh, incorrect, but it is worth pointing out, and I have pointed uh, this out to, the, to some advocates for, for free market housing, that uh, many Americans today choose to join homeowners associations, co-ops, condos, or other uh, organizations unanimously uh, agreed to that have substantial amounts of control over the property and even aesthetic appearance of, uh, of housing inside those, uh, those developments. And uh, that's clearly a demand. There is a demand by people to have some amount of control over their local environment in a semi-democratic process. Now, We'd like that to happen more through those sorts of unanimous agreements as opposed to, uh, as opposed to municipal mandated zoning. Uh, but when we talk about limiting the, the damages of zoning, and they're real and substantial, we need to think about how can we accommodate those demands for some amount of local control. We, we do want people to care about what goes on in their neighborhoods, but we also, I think they need to understand that um, you control your own property. Uh, but, but I like your point about the homeowners associations. I, I never liked those because it's just the one time my wife and I tried it, uh, we lasted about a year and a half. I just could, we just couldn't take the you know, the big well, for me, exactly. For yeah, me, this seems more. like a nightmare, and yeah. I wouldn't want somebody telling me what to do with my mailbox right. or the color of my window shutters or whatever it is. Uh, but apparently, many Americans do like that, and you know, this is is part of the free market as well. They're choosing to join these organizations uh, that do have substantial amount of control over their property, and they're choosing it freely. Uh, so that does leave out the question of. What about those people who are in existing neighborhoods that don't have those HOAs that uh, accompany them? Uh, again, we need to understand they want some amount of local control, but at the same time trying to convince them that you can't have complete blockages of development and you can't uh, expropriate someone else's property rights and accrue yes. the benefits to yourself without some sort of consequence. Right, right. And um, the consequence in California has been that our home prices are, are just outrageous. I just saw uh, the National Association of Realtors, their latest study showed that the, the median home price statewide in California, and that it means we're talking including places like Bakersfield, Fresno, inland places that have not traditionally been hot markets, 
is over nine hundred thousand dollars, and in Orange County, it's like one point five million dollars, and that's partly a consequence of of this NIMBYism, right? Well, it's, yes, it's almost wholly a, a downstream consequence of NIMBYism and government regulations that are preventing the development of housing. Uh, in a largely free market for housing, you'd expect uh, a housing unit to cost pretty much what it costs to construct. Uh, and that can vary to some extent, but you know, let's guesstimate it around $150 per square foot to $200 per square foot. Uh, obviously, these $1.5 million housing, houses in Orange County or elsewhere are many multiples of that. And that's a simple uh, effect of restricting the amount of supply. Now, the, the question is what to, do, what to do about it. There are these state-level laws, some of which I've worked on, that are trying to mandate that the local governments allow more housing. Those are often very appropriate, and you need some sort of push to encourage uh, more upzoning, as it's known, to allow that local development, even if you're not totally overturning local control. Uh, but one of the things I like to think about here are what are the incentives that make certain governments either want to develop or not want to develop? Because in a sense, zoning is a necessary but not a sufficient uh, explanation or cause for high housing prices. There are many areas in zoning, uh, with zoning, and many parts of America historically that had pretty low housing prices. If you look at America, the cost of houses uh, was pretty close to the cost of construction you know, almost everywhere up until the 1980s or 1990s. Uh, so this is a pretty recent phenomenon, even though zoning goes back uh, basically almost 100 years at this point. And, um, and on your panel, someone, uh, I forget who it was who mentioned that on the panel, that it started as kind of a racist thing, right? Well, there was, there were some aspects of this. There were some explicit racial zoning uh, categories where, in the famous case of Buchanan v. Worley, the Supreme Court struck that down and said, you cannot say there is a black part of town and a white part of town. And there is has been the argument that regular zoning, based on class or house size or et cetera. Economic zoning. Economic zoning is to some extent a substitute for that. Now, I think that's that's to some extent true, and there's evidence that areas with uh, more minorities occasionally have stricter zoning rules. But at the same time, I do point out uh, to some people that states back in the 1920s and 30s with no pretense of, of a substantial minority population, you know, Places like Minnesota, where the darkest person around was likely Danish, uh, also adopted zoning. Uh, and so there was there was clearly this demand for it to happen. And again, that didn't seem to substantially affect housing prices really until very recently. And so that necessary con condition was there, but the sufficient condition wasn't. And to my mind, you really need to think about, well, what are the incentives that make local governments want to develop more, and what are what do they not, what uh, incentives make them not want to develop more. Because many, like, there's zoning in California as well as in Texas, uh, in Dallas as well as in Los Angeles. What What is different about Dallas's political situation uh, from Los Angeles? And clearly, some of that has to do with everything, like the fiscal incentives and some other reasons that people are more likely to want to build up uh, in Texas. Well, what, one issue, um, well, first off, what, is, what might be an incentive? Is it maybe a political incentive, just a, a belief in markets and, and progress and growth, as opposed to a, a, in California, there's just this political vibe against growth and against uh, new residents, where Texas seems very welcoming? Yeah, I, there's part of that. It is just a general ideological environment. Uh, but I, I think that itself is also like not a sufficient explanation, because if you look at... Uh, some of the, the the ways that zoning is constrained in Texas uh, versus California. I think one of the best ways it's done is the fact that Texas, it's fairly easy to grow outwards. And it's actually pretty easy to create not just competing developments, but competing cities that basically drive down what we could call the monopoly rents of existing cities. So let's say there's a, just like a monopoly in a private market, Let's say there's one big monopolist that can prevent any new cities from growing, and they can reduce the uh, the amount of development and therefore increase the prices. If there's lots of different competing areas, you can actually reduce that that benefit they could get because hey, you reduce development here, and the belt, development just goes down the road, and you get real no benefits from it. So in Texas, you can form these things called municipal utility districts or MUDs. They can basically create their own water and sewer and highways and pay for all this uh, basically out of the, the property taxes of the new development as it grows. And that helps suppress that desire of local governments to, uh, to prevent development, precisely because 
they don't get as much of the upside. You prevent it here, and it's just going to happen down the road. So I think partially we need to think about how to, just like we want more competition in uh, in the private sector, we want more competition in government. Well, you know, I have a, I have a new booklet for PRI coming out about uh, new cities and the effort to build new cities, and I look at all the many planned communities, because there, there was a proposed new city in Solano County uh, between Sacramento and San Francisco, and it was it was pulled from the ballot, uh, and, and it should be coming back in two years, but obviously cre created a lot of controversy. Uh, but my argument was that we've been building new cities forever, and we should be experimenting uh, with new cities. But I looked at Houston, which still doesn't have zoning, and the public always rejects proposals to impose zoning. But actually, Houston has a lot of master plan communities that have homeowners associations. Yeah. So a large percentage of Houston residents choose to live in that kind of like the woodlands. They, yeah. they choose to live, and then people like us would probably move in town because if they build a high rise behind my house, I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, they'd get more uh, more friends around and more amenities. Hopefully, they come with it. But but another point about Texas and some of those other markets and the, this whole idea of, of uh, you know there being a desire in those communities to to build more is and you you had talked earlier about your background in the mortgage uh, uh, doing research on mortgages during the two thousand and eight um, uh, bust the housing bust I, I had read some articles that had pinpointed growth controls to the de degree that there was a bust because mm -hmm. in some in some communities like in Texas it, it, the market went down yeah, yeah. but not nearly like it did in growth controlled areas because the market was able to to meet supply and demand where in us growth controlled areas it just can't there's too much of a backlog to build a new development. It takes two years to permit them. Does that ring true to you? Oh, you totally. Know? If you look at uh, housing prices across the U.S. in the lead up to 2008, we often think of this kind of chart that shows a big bump that peaks around 2006, 2007, and then starts to decline afterwards. But that was very city and state dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, you did not see substantial price increases in much uh, across the middle of the United States precisely because they were largely unzoned, they allow, or minimally zoned, they allowed growth outward. Uh, the, the, as one would expect with your basic supply and demand sort of curve, quantity responded, not price. If you restrict the, the, the quantity, the price has to go up when you have a lot more of these government subsidies and increased demand for housing. If you don't restrict the quantity, the quantity grows and the, uh, the price stays pretty level. Now, post-2008, a lot of people said, oh, places like Phoenix, where we currently are, uh, they overbuilt housing, and that was the real problem. Uh, and so even maybe growth controls would have limited the, quote-unquote, damage from that uh, excessive overbuilding. But in reality, we know now prices are actually substantially higher than they ever were in the so-called peak of 2006. Uh, we didn't have an overbuilding problem. We had an underbuilding problem precisely in those areas that were really restricted. And the fact that we had a giant financial collapse nearly caused a temporary decline in prices and, and increase in vacancies in a few of those those largely free cities. But those were taken up after 2010 and onwards the, and the recovery. And so, yeah, the, the actual price explosion was largely limited to these locally over-controlled areas. Now, let's change gears. You had mentioned on the housing panel about permitting reform. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that is and why it's such a good idea? It struck me as an extremely good idea. Uh, it's something that I'm very excited about. So we've already discussed a little bit about the problems with uh, with local NIMBYism trying to block development and trying to encourage more of that or force more of that at the state level. Now, one of the reasons I like the idea of permitting reform is it actually sidesteps a lot of those issues. It says, we're not actually going to talk about how much density you're going to have in your neighborhood because we know the sort of opposition that elicits. But we are going to talk about, hey, how do we make the actual permitting process for the existing codes, taking those existing building, electrical, et cetera, codes as given, how do we make that smoothly as possible so there's not just waste in that? And one way to do that is to allow independent parties, uh, private providers, to do inspections, uh, do uh, government permit approvals, do... Uh, document review, plan reviews, plat reviews, all of these things that have to go into the, the permitting of a house. And to some people this sounds a little wild, but in fact, throughout large parts of the, parts of the country, especially in smaller areas, it's already done. They don't have the, the manpower for a government-run permitting office. They just say, hey, you private providers, you, you do the inspection, 
you're liable if something goes wrong. You certify it with your own name and business on the line. And then you, uh, and then it's, we can check up on you afterwards. And that works largely well. It just doesn't often apply in those large cities that try to run it all outside their own office. So there's actually been some really positive reforms in Texas, Florida, Tennessee, uh, and elsewhere that are allowing pretty much statewide people to go to these third party permitters and get inspections quicker, quicker get permits quicker. Uh, again, with no sort of debate about how much development we want as a whole, because these are things that are already allowed. We're just making sure they go through the process. Well, yeah, I, I had a uh, new insurance policy, and they just had me do the, it's, they went to a, contracted with a, a separate company, mm -hmm. and I, they, I downloaded the app, and I did a video of the whole house, mm -hmm. and then they would send an inspector if they needed more, but there's no reason for a building inspection as, as long as the company doing it certifies. Yeah. And I, I tried, I, I did some remodeling in a small town where, where you go down, down to City Hall and they'll send uh, Gus or Mac or whatever his name is right right over that afternoon. It's not that big of a deal, yeah. but in some of the California cities, you've got to wait oh. two months or six weeks or four it, weeks. It can devastate the very possibility of these developments happening at all. If you have that, let's just say, no business is time is money more true than in development where you have high financing costs where you have a lot of men and material you actually have on site you have to pay whether or not these things are going through and if you have to just sit there twiddling your thumbs why a, an electrical inspector from the city uh, takes a week uh, or plus to, to get over there then yeah that can make it less like you, you need the building in the first place so yeah allowing these third parties to do it uh, very sensible again already done in many other spheres in some sense it can be even more responsible than the government inspector doing it because the government often immunizes itself against any liability. They say, hey, we do the inspection, but if it collapses afterwards because we miss something that has nothing to do with us, the private sector can say, no, we're, we're holding ourselves accountable if something goes wrong. Uh, so far from like uh, uh, reducing the, the actual uh, responsibility of builders and developers to meet these codes, if anything, it's increasing it, but it's doing it all a lot more rapidly and doing it with much less cost. Sure. Once I, I went to a, uh, a government, uh, the planning department, and I was told one thing, and then we spent a lot of money based on that one thing we were told, and then that person no longer was there, and we went back, and they said, no, that was wrong. Sorry, you have to do it all this way, which cost a whole bunch of other money. There was no accountability. No. If it were a private company, I'd probably have some sort of uh, some sort of recourse. You go to the Better Business Bureau, or next time you're going to a different provider. You're saying, "Hey, that I, I was doing everything right, and I still uh, uh, still got held up indefinitely." Yeah, that's the sort of thing that can happen, and I, I'm very optimistic that can spread beyond the, the basic states that have adopted it already. Oh yeah, and one one last uh, thing before we wrap up, we had to, we had discussed. Uh, about some water is issues, mm -hmm. and I did a book for PRI called Winning the Water War, so it always interests me, and you have been doing some research uh, on water water rates yeah. and how that might promote conservation. Could you uh, you know, give a little bit of a rundown? On yeah, I, I'm looking at, uh, I think one of the other aspects, kind of understudying aspects of, of the housing crisis in a lot of these major cities and states, is that you don't just need things to be legally allowed, you need the infrastructure to be there. And that is a difficult question if the government still has to provide the infrastructure in some way, shape, or form, how do you make them do that? Now, one solution is something like the MUDs that I talked about in Texas, where the private sector can actually just build out, build this stuff out. Uh, the, the other sort of so solution is to reorienting these existing water and sewer utilities, which are a massive part of local government, actually more spent on water and sewer than on police or housing and transit combined, all of these things that we, we think of as major local government functions. Uh, but right now, water utilities kind of and sewers see their job as limiting the consumption of water. They have basically an environmentalist mindset that we should prevent people from using too much of this. But historically, that wasn't the case. They saw their job as like an electrical company and what else. Let's maximize this consumption. Uh, but right now, part of limiting that resource, uh, water and sewer, is preventing people from developing. Often you'll say, hey, we don't want to have uh, pipes out to this new development precisely because... Uh, that's going to draw down our water supplies, and we're worried about that. Or we're worried about the sewer output into the local river. And rather than build to accommodate that, which can easily be done in many of these cases, they just say we'd rather prevent development. And that's precisely the wrong way to think about it. We need these back, these local utilities, either privatized or more on an orientation that thinks about 
growing the base of their product, which is water is literally one of the most renewable, well, reusable well, projects. 50% it, goes out to the Pacific. Yeah, right all here. of this flows out, as you know as well as anybody. This uh, uh, this flows out all the time. We are, there's plenty of it around, despite occasional hand-wringing by environmentalists. For and really occasional droughts. And occasional droughts. You drought, more water when it's dry, and yeah. you use, and you more use it otherwise. And you can accommodate and make the facilities to do this. But the important point I think you made, uh, one of them, was that um, a lot of people use water as a growth control method. Yeah. So Santa Barbara for years wouldn't connect to the state water project because they didn't want the growth. Yeah. And uh, after a grueling drought, I think it was in the 90s, they finally they did. Finally did. <laughs> so you have to actually be out of water before they would. And I've even I've even talked with conservatives who say, well, I'm all for more infrastructure, but we don't need more people or blah, blah, blah. So people, anybody does it. Yeah. And, and that's the impact of this on um Urbanism yeah. is the fact that if, if you use water to limit, uh, you know, if you're just limiting water, you're limiting the ability to have more houses. And, yeah. and everything else, everything there that goes into a successful community. And we, we as, uh, as participants in local governments, as society, should not be thinking about water as that way, of this thing that we can use to squelch all possibilities of growth. Like it should be the opposite. It should be that lifeblood of life that it's allowing things to, uh, to develop and the fact that's not happening, the fact that water prices and sewer prices are going up consistently for this this natural product that's basically a commodity that's been in place now as a utility for hundreds of years at this point uh, is absurd. And, uh, you know, hopefully if we can reorient those utilities and uh, privatize them, that we can get back to a more fruitful understanding of it. Well, Judge, thank you for your, your time. Uh, could you uh, tell our, our viewers where they could read some of your articles? Yeah, and, I, you can just look me up at Judge Glock at the Manhattan Institute, uh, or you can do at Judge Glock at Twitter. Well, thank you for your time, and thank you uh, for watching. <laughs>